Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be comparing two numbers, pi squared and 10. This problem was suggested by one of my viewers a while ago. I'm sorry, I can't remember who suggested it, but if it's you, please come forward so that I can give you credit. Anyways, we have two numbers, pi squared and 10, and we're gonna figure out which number is larger. Maybe you already know the answer, or you do know the answer, but you may not know the proof. Let's go ahead and take a look. Obviously, this problem can be solved in three different ways, third of which would be using an infinite series and approximating pi. But I'll be presenting two methods, and let's start with the first one. So for my first method, I'm going to use an identity that is equal to pi squared over 6. Not pi or pi squared, but pi squared over 6. And I think this is due to Euler. And Euler came up with so many nice equations and identities that give us, you know, uh, pi or something like that. Anyways, pi squared over 6 can basically be written as an infinite sum, n equals 1 to infinity, of 1 over n squared. So the reciprocals of uh, perfect squares can be all added infinitely many times, and that's actually going to give us pi squared over 6, which is amazing, right? So we can go ahead and expand it a little bit as 1. If you replace n with 1, that's going to be a giant 1, and then 1 over 4, and then 1 over 9, and then 1 over 16, so on and so forth. This is an infinite sum, but guess what? The terms get smaller and smaller like crazy, so the sum is finite. We say this converges, okay? I'm not going to get into the proof or how to come up with this. I think, is this called Basil's problem? No, not really. Maybe something else. Anyways, let's go ahead and see what we can do uh, to prove uh, which number is larger by using this identity. So, take a look at this. I can take this sum, pi squared over 6, and instead of starting at 1, I can start at 2. So, expand for n equals 1, this is going to be 1. So, I kind of separate this 1, and then start my sigma sum at 2. Makes sense, right? You can always do that. Take, uh, take out some terms. And then we're going to be adding all these terms to infinity. Now, here's one thing that's very important. A lot of times we use these in proofs because we want to turn this into something telescoping. Uh, I'll show you what that means in a little bit. But I want to compare 1 over n squared to something else that is factorable by difference of two squares. And that's what it is. Notice this. I'm going to go ahead and write it down here, and then I'll use it on top, okay? So 1 over n squared can be written as 4 over 4n squared. And, this part is super important, this is less than 4 over 4n squared minus 1. You get the idea? Why? And we use this idea, by the way, to prove convergence or divergence of series, uh, comparison test, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Anyways, the... Expression on the left is less or smaller because the expression on the right has a smaller denominator. Make sense? So, and all of these are positive terms, obviously. So the, the expression, the fraction with the smaller denominator is bigger. Make sense? Great. But not only this, this is going to help us a lot because this can basically be factored into 2n minus 1 and 2n plus 1. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to separate this. I'll show you in a little bit. But let me go ahead and do this first. Since this is less than that, and I can add one to both sides, and kind of replace the expression inside the sigma with the larger term, so that the sum, because general term is less than the other one, the sum of all these terms, n equals 2 to infinity, are also going to satisfy the same inequality. Make sense? Okay. So if you add smaller numbers, obviously that's going to be less than the sum of larger numbers. Make sense? Okay, great. So now let's see what we can do with this expression right here. Okay, so we're going to take that 4 over 4n squared minus 1. And again, I'm going to go ahead and write it as difference of two squares. So, so I can factor it like this. And then without further ado, I mean, the idea is basically to write it like this. And this is called partial fractions. And I'm planning on making a separate video on how to do partial fractions. I already have the notes, but I just need to find the time to sit down and record it. But anyways, 
to keep a long story short, the a and b values are going to be 2 and negative 2. So let me go ahead and not get into the proof because that's fairly easy. This is just going to be 2 and negative 2. All right? So cool. Now we can go ahead and just put a minus sign here and put a 2 here. And when you make a common denominator, you're going to realize that you, that actually gives you 4. Make sense? That's the whole idea. Great. Now we've got a telescoping sum. Therefore, here's the conclusion. Pi squared over 6 is now less than, less than 1 plus this sum. n equals 2 to infinity, 2 over 2n minus 1, minus 2 over 2n plus 1. And notice that this is a telescoping sum, which means the terms are going to cancel. You're going to see when we expand it, okay? Let's go ahead and expand it. Pi squared over 6 is less than 1 plus. Now, when you replace n with 2, you're going to get 2 over 3 minus 2 over 5. And when you do with the next term, which is 3, you're going to get 2 over 5 minus 2 over 7, and then 2 over 7 minus 2 over 9, uh, infinitum. Okay, so on and so forth. And notice that everything is going to cancel out, like negative 2 over 5, 2 over 5, this one, that one, everything else, except for 2 thirds, so that's the only thing that's left. In other words, pi squared over 6, and this is a really nice upper bound, is less than 1 plus 2 thirds, which is 5 thirds. And guess what? This is going to turn into something amazing. And if you multiply both sides by 6, you're going to get pi squared is less than 5 over 3 times 6. 3 goes into 6 2 times. 5 times 2 equals 10. So this gives us pi squared is less than 10. And we were looking for the larger number, therefore the winner is 10. Yay, an integer wins over irrationals. All right, so far so good. All right, if you're ready, let's go ahead and talk about the second method. The second method is also really cool because this idea comes from a Putnam problem. Putnam is a math competition for college students in the United States, and those are very, very hard problems. Okay, unlike IMO, there can be questions from abstract algebra, linear algebra, differential equations, so on and so forth. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We have an integral like this. Let me write it down for you. 0 to 1, and this is a definite integral, so you can definitely solve for it, right? Not too hard because these are all polynomials. And when you evaluate this integral, here's what you're going to get. First of all, when you expand it, like the whole thing, and divide... This is what it's going to turn into. Notice that we're going to get x to the 8th divided by x squared. So we're going to start with x to the 6th power. And then minus 4x to the 5th plus 5x to the 4th minus 4x squared plus 4 minus. We're going to have a remainder, obviously, and that needs to be divided by the divisor. So that's going to be our, after the polynomial division, this is going to be our integrand, right? If you integrate it, you're going to get the following, x to the 7th divided by 7 minus 2x to the 6th divided by 3 plus x to the 5th minus 4x cubed over 3 plus 4x minus 4 tangent x. Such a nice way to finish it, right? And this is 0 to 1. And if you plug it in like you're going to replace x with 1 and 0, but 0 is just going to give you 0, so don't worry about it. This is going to give you 1 over 7 minus 2 thirds plus 1 minus 4 thirds plus 4. And what is 4 tangent 1? It is just going to be... I'm sorry, did I write tangent? It's supposed to be arc tangent, obviously not tangent, right? I'm integrating 1 over 1, sorry about that. And arc tangent 1 is just going to be pi over 4, right? Which means when multiply by 4, it's just going to be pi. Awesome. This is just awesome, you know why? And they obviously did it on purpose. And this is just a great concoction, or should I say uh, contrived problem? But anyways, this gives us 22 over 7 minus pi. Isn't that beautiful? Does that look familiar? Now. Here's the fun part. The integrand is positive. Why? Because it's basically a product of positive expressions. And since x is between 0 and 1, this is definitely going to be positive, right? It's not going to be 0. Awesome. Now, if you integrate a positive function, the integrand, the integral is also going to be positive because think about it. If the curve is above the x-axis, it's considered a positive area. So this is greater than 0, and that's just awesome. Wait a minute. Didn't you know that? Pi is approximately 22 over 7, but this just means pi is less than 22 over 7. So 22 over 7 is an overestimate of pi, but it's a pretty good one. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to square both sides, and yay! It's going to give us 
pi squared is less than 484 divided by 49, which is less than 490 divided by 49, which is 10. Awesome. Pi squared is less than 10, and 10 is the winner one more time. And this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time in another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and keep watching. Bye-bye.